Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He was a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anybody be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord, at this time, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Silence in us any thoughts but your own, that hearing we may believe, and believing we may obey your will, revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you know and have read Sue Monk Kidd. She's a well-known author. She shares a story of when she was pregnant with her second child. Her three-year-old son, Bobby, was afraid of the dark. Sue and her husband had tried everything with little Bobby. They tried leaving a light on in the hallway and then a nightlight in little Bobby's room. Nothing seemed to help. <laughs> been in this frustrating place before with my own children. The little Bobby was still scared of the dark. He would cry out in the middle of the night. One night as she held him to comfort him, he touched her round abdomen and asked, Mommy, is it dark in there where my little brother is? <laughs> you see, little Bobby was convinced that his yet unborn sister would be a boy. Yes, the mother replied, it's dark in there. And as Bobby thought further, he asked, He doesn't even have a nightlight, does he? No, Sue responded, not even a nightlight. And then Bobby hugged his mother as she patted him on his head. <clears throat> Bobby had one more question for his mother that night. Do you think my brother is scared because he's all by himself in there? The mother thought for a few seconds. I don't think so, she explained. Because he's really not alone, he's inside of me. There was a long pause. Indeed, it was a special moment between a mother and her son. And suddenly the mother, Sue, had an inspiration. And you know, it's the same way with you. When it's dark and you are scared and think that you're all by yourself, you really aren't. I carry you inside of me, right here in my heart. Sumon Kid remembers looking into her son's eyes, wondering if in any way he understood what she meant. Having nothing else to say, Bobby went back to bed and was soon asleep. She ends the story by sharing that it was the last time that he ever woke up in the night, scared. Now, children aren't the only ones who are afraid when night falls. 
In our story today, Nicodemus is also somebody. This story shares he was a high-ranking member of the Pharisees. They were the ones that were always counter to the teachings of Jesus throughout the Gospels. He was confused, it says. He was frightened. Nothing was making sense to him that night. It seemed like the more that he struggled to understand about life and the world and about the Jewish faith, the more confused and frightened he became. Then he heard about Jesus and he thought that perhaps maybe this Jesus could help me. So under the cover of darkness, Nicodemus was set out to find this itinerant preacher. He was growing in popularity. He was getting a big name. Jesus was known to be on the outskirts of town. Unfortunately, Jesus wasn't much help to this spiritually troubled man, and at some point in their conversation, Jesus just tells Nicodemus, nobody can see the kingdom of God without being born again. And Jesus was speaking, of course, of spiritual rebirth, but Nicodemus was responding by thinking that this was physical birth. How can anybody be born again after having grown old, Nicodemus asks. I mean, can he go back into his mother's womb? Oh, Nicodemus was confused. Jesus was not making any sense to him. So Jesus then further confuses this Jewish leader by saying that people will one day look at the cross and not die, but live. Jesus states, just as Moses lifted that serpent up in the wilderness to show the Israelites that what they feared could no longer hurt them, the Son of Man must also be lifted up so that anybody who believes in him will have eternal life, salvation. It was a teaching in contrast by our Lord. Be saved by seeing the very thing that you fear that can kill you, the snake, Be saved by the very thing that Jesus thought at his time that the Romans did. It was the most cursed way of dying. The Romans killed people on the cross. That was Jesus' advice to Nicodemus. Look to the cross. And in those moments when you fear and your fear seems seems to be getting the better of you, when the light is at the end of that tunnel and, and there's an oncoming train coming right at you, When all of your good luck has turned to bad luck, that's when you look to the cross for salvation. That's where hope lies. Hope lies on this hill called Golgotha. So when we are discouraged and when we are down and nearly out and when we are experiencing our own dark night of the soul, then we look to the cross for salvation. Well, that was the discovery that Harry Tuchert made. You see, for years, Harry had been the successful publisher in his company of anniversary books for organizations, kind of like Life Touch. Schools, churches, all of them would hire him. Everything in his life seemed to be perfect. I mean, business was good, his home was lovely, his family, a solid future, all of his life then suddenly crashed. His wife informed him that she was leaving him. She was in love with someone else. Harry was devastated. He tried his best. He tried to cope. He buried himself in his work. He tried to go on continuing in his life, but this tragedy was just so overwhelming for him. His marriage was ending in divorce. Gosh, he must be at fault somewhere. Where had he gone wrong? Why hadn't he seen the signs? Despite all the positives that he had going for him, he felt suddenly like he was a complete failure with nothing else to do to live for. So there he was. He was on the road, keeping up with his accounts, doing his best. He was traveling to a church for a meeting with an anniversary committee and to lay out how the publication would look. So arriving early before the rest of the people on a hot summer day, he went into the church. He was all alone. He sat down in the fellowship hall underneath the church where it was cooler. His life seemed over. He was finished, he thought. Gosh, he was so depressed. He was so lost. And as he sat at that table, he began to cry. 
intensively. He was holding his head in his, in his hands, and the more he wept, the more he was convinced that his life had ended and that he couldn't take anything more. He was beaten. And then as he looked up in total despair, he noticed kind of across the room on the other wall, it was the depiction of a man that kind of looked like him. I mean, something had gone totally wrong in this man in the picture's life. It showed in his face. It showed in his body language. Boy, it seemed like this man was experiencing the same thing that Harry was. His head was in his hands. He looked in complete anguish. So as he studied the poster further, he noticed down to the right this smaller image down in the bottom. And in it, there was the small picture, and it portrayed three crosses on, on a hill. And it was surrounded by an ashen, darkened sky. And beneath the center cross were these simple words, I know how you feel. I have been there myself. Jesus. And then while staring at these words, Harry fell to his knees and he prayed, God help me. And suddenly he said, Harry felt the power of the Holy Spirit start to inundate his entire being. And he rose wearily and he promised himself, I can do this. I'm going to beat this thing. I can do this because Jesus Christ strengthens me. And after that prayer, and then over a short period of time, and then over a longer period of time, Harry slowly got his life back together, and he never looked back. And he went on, and he got more involved in his church. He started going on short-term mission trips, the story says. He started being a worship leader. He was fixing items around the church. He helped lead Sunday school. He served the Lord who came to him in his greatest moment of need. God had rescued him. So it bears asking all of us this morning, are you in pain or in depression or in anguish in any way today? And no, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> like Harry Tuchert, <laughs> like Nicodemus, some of us might be sitting here in pain. I'll venture that there are a few of us that are. The advice, the anecdote from our Lord on this day is that he asks us to see him through the lens of this cross. It's kind of like you have glasses on and in the, a cross is embedded right across the middle of it. Not only look at it, but embrace the cross in your life wherever you find it. You know, I have to say, sometimes I admire my Catholic friends because of their use of the rosary. There's something that's nice about the tactile feelings about that cross that they hold in their hands. Worship practices that draw our strengthening from Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying to us this morning, I know how you feel. I've been there. Look at the cross. And by the way, listen to similar words as we share those with Bridget today in her baptism. But the story of Nicodemus doesn't just end there. I wouldn't be doing a good job in interpreting the full amount of grace that is present in this lesson if I ended the sermon right there. It doesn't end saying that we need to be born again or by alluding to some sort of direction out there of the cross. Jesus has more of a message for Nicodemus and consequently for us as well. It was to the hurting Nicodemus that Jesus then spoke these next words, the most famous words in Scripture, some of us would say, For God so loved the world, as Kim shared with our children just a few moments ago. God saved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but instead have eternal life. God so loved the world. See, Jesus is trying to move Nicodemus from a life of law, a life as a Pharisee, a life as a Jew of that time, to a life that accentuated the love and the grace that comes from with that, the unconditional mercy of God. He was trying to impress on Nicodemus the extravagance of God's grace. 
He was trying to tell Nicodemus that God's devotion to all of God's children is beyond measure. It is love. Love in its purest form. There's a story to illustrate this that comes out of the Bedouin culture. Bedouin is the Aramaic term, the Arabian term, the Middle Eastern term of desert dwellers. These people lived much like the characters of the Old Testament. We can kind of picture it. They're very tribal. They live in tents. It's out in desolate wilderness areas. During a heated argument, apparently, a young Bedouin man struck and he killed one of his friends in the heat of an argument. Knowing the ancient inflexible customs of his people, that young man knew he was in trouble and he fled under the cover of darkness, seeking safety anywhere, and he went to the black tent. Now the black tent was where the chief of the tribe lived. It was in the center of all the others. And he asked the tribal chief, seeking protection from him. And the chief, knowing again the statutes of that tribe, took the young man in. And the chief assured him that he would be safe until the matter could be settled legally, what the customs called for. Soon later, friends and family of the victim, of the man who was killed, arrived at the tent of the chief, demanding that that murderer be sent out over to them. They would see that the justice would prevail in their own way, but I gave him my word, the chief said. But you don't know whom he killed, they countered. I have given him my word to protect him, the chief repeated. But he killed your son, blurted one of the crowd. Well, the chief was obviously shocked, and he was deeply and visibly shaken by the news, as everyone would expect. And, and he stood there speechless for the longest time, his head bowed down. He even cried quite quietly for a few minutes. It was kind of a standoff, the accused and the accusers, as well as any of the curious onlookers that were near. They all waited breathlessly for how this was going to play out. There was complete silence. What would happen now to this young man? Finally, the tribal chief, he raised his head and he stated, Then this man shall become my son, he informed them, and everything I have will be his one day. You see, it wasn't just the right practical answer for the chief to make, you know, to get himself out of this kind of tight situation, this political and legal confusion. It certainly was a wise decision, but it was also a sacrificial one to not only save the accused man, despite his tragic choice, his tragic mistake, but to also honor the customs of the tribe. And then there was more. To make the tragedy of his son's death into something meaningful and life-giving. No, the young man certainly didn't deserve that kind of generosity. None of us would think he did. And that, of course, is the point. Love, in its purest form, is beyond all comprehension. No one can merit it. It's freely given by God to all of us. To all of us. The unconditional love of God. You see, at this cross, we encounter love in its purest form. It's at this cross that we are set free from the dark nights of our soul. And we experience our own healing in the ways that uniquely God knows that we need to be healed. And ultimately giving us new life. So think about little Bridget today. The new life that is promised to her through the word, through the waters, through that promise. And as Sue Monk Kidd shared with her son, a God who carries each of us near his heart. Bobby, I carry you inside me just like our new baby, right here in my heart. And so it is with God, she explains further in her book. First God was only up there. And then I had a revelation. 
that God was actually all around me. And then I had a further revelation, and I started to see that God was also within me. And then Su Mung Kid continues, I finally had the last re revelation. It was the one that was most shocking of all, she says. And she ends her story by saying, I was finding that I am and always was within God. You know, maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, being born again. All God's glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all of our understanding, keep our hearts, keep our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.